Hello and welcome to Mary Live. This is Dr. Mark Miravalli. My friends, I'd like to talk about two things which oftentimes we simply take for granted. The first is God and His goodness. The second is Our Lady, the gift of God to each one of us. Now, bear with me as you know, maybe I can hear some of you saying, well, I, you know, I, I'm grateful for God and for Our Lady. Uh, let's go a little bit deeper, uh, perhaps, and let's look at this perhaps with fresh eyes, with a fresh mind, with a heart uh, that will God willing lead to a new appreciation. For example, do we take for granted the fact that this God who we have has ordered everything to goodness and everything for your salvation? Now, what do I mean by that? I mean that from the beginning of time, in fact, obviously, even before time begins, God has predestined, and that's the Catholic understanding of providence, he's ordered all things so that people are rewarded for doing good, and ultimately all things are ordered for both the glory of God and our salvation. Now, that doesn't have to be. There's no inner necessity for God even to create us, let alone for him to order everything to assist us in getting to a place called heaven. And again, I know that you believe in heaven. I know you believe in God. I'm with you all that. I'm there too. But do we take for granted the fact that we get rewarded for doing good things? that God has ordered all things in the universe to try to get us home, to, to save us. And that, you know, as the poet says, he's the hound of heaven, that he's always seeking new ways. He's always sniffing out possibilities, if you will, to encourage us here or there, to give us a grace here or there, even on our deathbed, to seek us as, again, the hound of heaven, to try to get us to say yes. He doesn't have to do all that. We, we inherited this incredibly loving creator. Have we ever thanked him for his goodness? I don't mean for the good things. I mean just for his goodness. And that his goodness has, has created this master universal plan so that we can have happiness forever. My gosh, what an incredible presupposition to start with. And that's why it's so tragic that our brother and sister atheists, and I say brothers and sisters because we're still part of the human family, even though we're not brothers and sisters in Christ, that they're rejecting this. I, I, I know a, a, a dear person that, you know, is losing so much love and joy of his life because he simply won't accept that God exists, although he still acts in a certain way as if God exists and, you know, actually asks for prayers at times. But day in and day out, he doesn't get the love because he's not open to the love. God doesn't force his love on us. And, and I, I feel the tragedy of a mistaken concept because that's ultimately what it is. Atheism is an error of the mind, which also includes a great error of the heart, and not to count out the old accuser, the, the adversary, the, the he who in his ultimate pride wants to steal people from the Father and wants to be God himself. That's the ego of Lucifer. And so he encourages people to reject God and to, to reject this master plan. So all of us, right, we, if we're wise and we seek to be prudent, we make plans. We make plans most every day. Uh, but we have even bigger plans, plans for our life, plans for the future of our homes and, and our situations. But what about a master planner, this, this divine planner who's planned everything for the good? It didn't have to be that way. And, and that's why we should, even now, my friends, even during this, this little broadcast, just say, thank you, Lord, for your goodness. Thank you, Heavenly Father, 
that you planned things for my benefit, that you gave a universal plan, a plan of all providence, but also you wrote that plan on my heart, as Romans say, Romans first. You know, we all have the, the, the natural law written on the human heart. He's so good, my friends, that not only does he plan everything for our good, but he orders it in our hearts so that we get it and we understand it. And if that's not enough, he sends his son down to die for us. Now, again, we've heard that, most of us, if we're you know, baptized as kids, uh, and even if we're not, if we're later converts, we hear that all the time. Really, would you sacrifice one of your kids for someone else? W would you do that? That's what the father did. The father sacrifices his only son for us. That's the ultimate fulfillment of his master plan, his, his love of providence. You know, sometimes people will say, you know, the Holy Spirit is the forgotten person of the Trinity. And certainly there's cases of that. I think God the Father is the forgotten person of the Trinity. I think sometimes we forget that we have this universal planner, this uncaused cause, who wants you to call him Papa. Yeah, not even just Father, but, but Papa, Daddy. That's the proper translation of what Abba means. It doesn't just mean Father, it means Papa. Our Abba, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name, holy be your name. That's where it all starts, is that this, this God, what a God we have, my friends, what a God. And, and we, we simply can't take it for granted, even in the midst of our busyness. And, you know, I, I oftentimes, just in light of my own sinfulness and my own forgetfulness to thank God for who he is and his goodness, I, I almost crack up at times in saying, you know, I mean, in, in, in a quasi-humorous way saying, God, do you have patience with me? My, how do you have so much patience with me? So many times you tell me the right way. So many times I choose ego or person. And then I get myself in a jam, and there you are to pick me out of it. There you are because your son's died for grace. So once again, I can be saved from my ignorance and sin and selfishness. Uh, and by ignorance, I'm talking about a willed ignorance, right? I know this is wrong, but I do it anyway. But the Father has already anticipated that, and that's why the Son comes to die. That's why his, his death is part of his incarnation, so that I can stay united to my Abba, to my Daddy. Um, I'm simply not worthy of it. None of us are worthy of it. This is the good God. This is the God we've been given through no merits of our own. Uh, a God who wants us to be successful in life. And that doesn't mean money or position or power. It simply doesn't. The West just has that wrong. Sorry. It means that we make it to heaven. It means that we enjoy eternal bliss, eternal joy, joy beyond our understanding with this Abba forever. That's success. So what a God we have and how at least at times of consciousness we just have to thank him straight up for, for him, for who he is. Abba, thank you. Thank you that you have ordered the whole plan of the universe and salvation and my life for my happiness. I'm utterly unworthy but I will be forever grateful. So what a God we have. And secondly, my friends, what a mother we have. A mother given to us by God, in particular, but obviously not exclusively, God the Son on Calvary, Ecce Matra Tua, behold your mother. Remember, my friends, what Jesus says on John 19, 26 to 27, 26 and 27. That's not just an invitation, that's a statement. Jesus is saying, behold. Behold means honor, acknowledge, respect, act on. There's not a condition there. It's not like he's saying, well, 
if you do something, I'm going to give you my mother. He's, he's establishing that as now an ontological, historical fact. We now have his mother as our mother. Ecce mater tua. Behold your mother. And then it's what we do about it, right? We can imitate John, the beloved disciple. We can take her home. We can benefit from this gift of a mother. And, and, and let me back up just a little bit because, again, going back to Abba Father, he wanted the order of things such that he wanted a woman to share with his divine son made man in making redemption possible. It's simply the facts. The, the reality of a new Eve is just the facts. Uh, that's why the early fathers get it right, and we should stay with the correctness of their understanding and saying, God chose a woman to be intimately involved in God's greatest act, ultimately the act of redemption. And he wanted a human woman involved in that. There's no possible human dignity that's higher, that's more sublime, that's more climactic in goodness than that. Uh, wasn't a pope, wasn't a bishop, wasn't a man, wasn't a priest. Okay, It was a woman who God chose to be part of this redemptive act. She's an immaculate woman. He made her that way. He's the one who puts this enmity between this woman and the serpent, between God's immaculate masterpiece, God's greatest creation, and God's most heinous creation. Not created heinously, but evolved heinously through a misuse of free will. So, this is the woman that Jesus gives us from Calvary. I say this from my heart without judgment, my friends, but what a calamity. What a disaster, a historic disaster, where through an error of theology, back in the 16th century, that so many Christians choose not to accept the mother that Jesus has given them. The Pope's right. Um, a Christian without Mary is an orphan. That's a tragic thing. Now, an orphan still has a parent, right? God the Father. Uh, in, in, in this perspective, in this application of the analogy, but they don't have the mom that Jesus wanted them to have. And of course, God the Father is, again, he's the great planner. He's the one who plans for Jesus to give us Mary. And that's why when you have the Immaculate Conception to find in 1854, Blessed Pius IX says that Jesus and Mary are part of the, the one and the same eternal decree. One and the same eternal decree that the Father always wanted the Son to, became, to, to become man and always wanted the woman to be part of that. One and the same eternal decree. That's, a, that's simply a part of a papal bull that leads to a papal definition. And so a mistake causes so many wonderful Christians. I judge no hearts with this. I'm simply saying it as a historic and ontological fact. So many Christians to lose their mom. So many Christians to not go to this woman for the graces that Jesus wants them to have through this woman. Otherwise, he wouldn't say, behold your mother. And the church is... Uh, in the generosity of the Father, again, guiding the church through the Holy Spirit, the spouse, the divine spouse of this woman, scatters throughout the liturgical year great manifestations of how important this woman is. One, for example, is on uh, July 16th. July 16th, the church celebrates Our Lady of Mount Carmel. Oh my gosh, it's such a beautiful feast. And, and what, what does the name mean, Our Lady of Mount Carmel? Well, we have a historic meaning to it because Mount Carmel was the refuge that Elijah used when he was being persecuted for being an honest prophet, for telling the truth on behalf of God to the people. 
Well, guess what? Uh, and this is certainly a consistency throughout all, throughout all history. Prophets get attacked because people don't like an authentic prophet's message. It's calling them to convert. It's pointing out their, uh, it really, it, it, it's giving a, a universal or in some cases a, a, a provincial or, 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 or a, a regional or a regal examination of conscience. We don't like that. Uh, we don't like to be told that we're fundamentally going in the wrong direction. My gosh, how much we need that today. And how many times Our Lady is saying that today as the queen of, of prophets. But Mount Carmel becomes known as a, as a refuge of divine protection for prophecy. And in the New Testament, it is through another prophecy, a prophecy that happens uh, in the early 13th century to St. Simon Stock, the minister general of the Carmelites, a prophecy from Our Lady about the power of a scapular, sacramentals. Uh, a sacramental leads to the sacraments. A, a sacramental focuses on our need to, co to cooperate with the sacraments. And so Our Lady appears to St. Simon Stock and promises that those who wear the scapular of the order, which is now known as the brown scapular, will receive the graces of final perseverance. They will be saved. They will persevere. How can she do that? Because she's the mediatrix of all graces. My gosh, my friends, if you have a problem with mediatrix of all graces, let's make it harder. Let's, let's talk about how a human woman mediates uncreated grace to us. That's called Jesus Christ. He's called Jesus Christ. That God so ordered this plan of love and, and success and happiness and joy that we get Jesus through a human woman. You think that had to happen? G.K. Uh, Chesson's right. We, we could get human babies on trees if God wanted. You know, you just go to this tree. Oh, that's a cute tree. That, there's a cute little kid on that tree. Or that. Or I want my kid a little bit more cheruby. Uh, you know, uh, so I'm going to get him from that tree. Jesus could have been, could have, had, could have had his human nature created by God directly. We're on a tree, as Chester did quips. God ordains we get Jesus through a woman. So, if Mary mediates Jesus, the, 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 the source of uncreated grace, what's the big deal about Mary mediating created grace after the passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus? Where's the stretch? Where's the challenge in believing that if you believe the first truth, that Mary brings us Jesus, who's the source of all graces to begin with? freely, not just as a physical channel. Don't go there. Don't go there. God doesn't use women as physical channels. That's not respectful. That's not nice. God always respects the freedom of every human and every woman. And so Mary says yes. So she's the moral instrument as well as the physical instrument uh, to bringing the God-man, to bringing the author of all grace into humanity. But this physical channel stuff, be careful. Don't, don't make Mary a surrogate mother. Uh, yeah, we kind of need her for her immaculate body to bring, to give Jesus the immaculate nature. But then off she goes, you know, we'll pay her off or we'll, we'll, we'll you know, compensate her in some other way, but, but it's done. No, no. She's part of the plan and she will continue to be part of the plan. She's concerned about what happens to her child and that's why she's at Calvary. And that's why she's uniquely present at Calvary in terms of her role as the new Eve with the new Adam. So at places like England in the 13th century, Our Lady gives a promise. And that promise reflects what the Second Vatican Council says in Lumen Gentium uh, number 62, that Mary, quote, brings us the gifts of eternal life. That's grace. Taken, in, taken into heaven, she does not cease to be our mother, but continues to intercede for the graces of eternal life. And that's why the council calls her the Mediatrix. And this is very similar, my friends, to what happens with the Five First Saturday devotion at Fatima. 
How can Mary, you know, give us a promise of, of heaven? What about free will? Yeah, heaven knows, God knows about free will. He's the author of it. He also knows that if you freely choose to go to Our Lady, then you are exercising your freedom in such a way that God can then guarantee your graces of heaven. Why? Because you exercise your freedom for that. And he can give you the grace that corresponds with your choice, your freely given choice. It's not magic. It's not a Calvinist predestination. It's the fruit of your choice. Uh, there's a wonderful example that uh, St. Alphonsus Liguori uh, uses in terms of things like the power of the scapular uh, with a man in Perugia who made a promise, made a deal with Satan to do a certain action with the help of Satan, promises to give him his soul for payment. Satan, uh, the action is done, the evil deed is done by the intercession of Satan, by the help of Satan. You know, we've got a ton of people doing that in our own age, certainly in the music industry from the 1920s on. There's, there's many great musical stars who've said, yeah, I sold my soul to Satan, and uh, I asked for the gift of music, uh, and they got it, in many cases, almost overnight. In any case, back to Perugia, this man uh, does this evil act through the help of Satan. Satan says, I want you to plunge yourself into a well. I want you to commit suicide, uh, which should, should be no surprise. Uh, Satan loves to mimic God the Father. And part of that mimicking is to have people sacrifice to him. Well, what's the greatest thing you can sacrifice? Well, life, the gift of the Father. That's why in a lot of satanic rituals, it, it, you also include uh, at an apex level, human sacrifice. So, once again, back to this guy in Perugia. He goes to the well. He, he's, a, he's afraid that, you know, he has no power uh, to get out of this pact with Satan. And he tries to thrust himself in the well, but he says, I, I can't do it. And he basically says to Satan, okay, you thrust me in. What does Satan respond? According to St. Alphonsus de Glory, what does Satan respond? He says, okay, well, take off your scapular, because the man had a, a scapular. And through a long process of debate and dialogue, the man realizes, wait a minute, Satan is powerless to kill me while I have this scapular on. And so eventually the man rebuffs Satan and is converted. And through the power of the scapular. Why? Because he, he used his free will to ask the Mediatrix of all graces to protect him. Just like Elijah was protected on Mount Carmel. Divine intervention. Well, in this case, it's Our Lady's. Mary's not divine, of course, but her human supernatural intervention. What, what many have said, uh, that God gives to Mary in the order of grace what she lacks in the order of nature because she's human. She's immaculately human, but she's still human. And that's why she's been called suppliant omnipotence. What does that mean? It means all powerful, not by nature, no human could be, but by grace, by intercession. Do you see how much God wants us to have this mother? Do you see the power of this mother? Do you see the sweet solicitude of this mother? She wants you and every one of her nearly 8 billion children to make it home. She, she ultimately is the great guide, the star that leads us to the plan of providence that God the Father has set out for all time and for all humanity, for all creation. But we get distracted. And in our fallenness, we turn away from this perfect plan. Even though, again, what a God we have. Plans everything to try to get us home, but... He will not violate his great gift of freedom to us. He won't force us to our happiness. Isn't that a sad thing? I mean, it's a great thing that he doesn't force us, but sad that we so fight the perfect plan of God the Father that in light of all he's done for us, we still in our humanness and our, and our you know, we're fickle people. We're a fickle human race. But he loves us anyway, and he keeps pounding grace towards us. He keeps 
you know, giving us more and more grace. Okay, we, we turn this way, we turn away from him, and he gives us more opportunities. These are called actual graces. He loves us so much. You know, you parents, you know how much you love your kids. You know you'd be willing to die for your kids, right? I mean, that's, that's not heroic for a parent to say, yeah, I'd take a bullet for my kid. I'd jump in front of a train for my kid. That's, that's, that's pretty normal. What about the father? How much more perfect, infinitely merciful, infinitely loving is his love for you and, and, and for your wife or husband and for your kids, for all humanity. And that's why he's ordained so much to get us home. Well, of the greatest, after Jesus, after Jesus, of course, forever, is the mother. What a God we have. Oh, what a mother we have. She is always looking for ways, like a good human mother would, to get us back on track or to increase us in our intimacy, our relationship, our level of grace with Jesus. What a mother we have. Let's please thank Jesus for the gift of the mother. And again, if, if you're uh, worried about forgetting until after the program, let's do it right now. Lord Jesus, it is inconceivable that you would love us so much that you would give us such an extraordinary mother. We praise you and, you and we thank you throughout our lives and for all eternity for the gift of Mary as our mother, that you would give us your mother as our mother, especially at the climactic moment of your suffering and death at Calvary. Because indeed, she is the price uh, of redemption in the sense that she comes because you love us so much that you died for us. Thank you, Lord, for our sweet mother. And, and please remind us, and we ask our guardian angels to remind us to more consistently thank you for the gift of our mother. And sweet mother, we thank you directly. We're not worthy, but we know that you don't care. We know that because you love us so much, you overlook our unworthiness, and you're always there as a mother to intercede, to help, to upbuild, and give us the grace always to come to you, Mother, especially after we sin, especially when we feel the most distant from our Lord Jesus, especially when we feel ashamed. Like, we, you're the last one we want to come to because you're immaculate. Help us to know, Mother, we're, you're the first one we should go to because you're immaculate and because you love us so. And so, you know, in, in light of this gift of the Father for, for such a perfect Abba Father, for perfect order of the whole universe and order of our own personal lives, including our crosses, by the way. Remember the story of St. Catherine of Siena, uh, the, the image of uh, going in and, and putting a cross down, uh, that which she conveys, of course. I'm not saying Catherine did it, but... And, and, and seeing, you know, a room full of many, many crosses, and Jesus says, pick what cross you would prefer. And she picks a particular cross only to come to realize it's exactly the cross she put down to enter this room with all the option of crosses. Uh, the crosses are there to purify us so that we can enjoy heaven with even greater merit, in, even, even greater uh, ecstatic joy for all eternity. So let's just be grateful for the God that we have. Let's be grateful for the mother that we have. And quite frankly, one way we show our gratitude is to not let their love go wasted, to respond to the Father's endless planning, perfect planning, infinite planning for us to make it to heaven. And so let's respond to that grace, and we do that by responding to our Lord Jesus, especially his Eucharistic presence, uh, to receive him, to adore him, uh, to confess to him through the priests so we can have our souls ready to be a perfect, uh, I should say, a, uh, always imperfect, but, but a proper do, uh, dwelling place for his divine presence and human presence in the Eucharist. And let's always go to the mother. Let's always be grateful for the mother. Let's, let's take advantage. Let's respond to her invitations. Things like the brown scapular, things like the five first Saturdays, and things like what the church universally teaches, that she is, make no mistake, the spiritual mother of all peoples, not just of Christians, of all peoples. And that's why God has appointed her 
with the mission of peace for all peoples. That's why the sooner we go to her for the needs of the world, including wars and disasters and chastisements and, and, and uh, elements of, of humanity which seem to be simply unbearable and certainly unquenchable, unsolvable by, by us alone, the sooner we go to the mother with these things, the sooner we will have remedy because she is the co-redemptrix. She is the mediatrix of all graces. She is advocate. And for those who may be confused about those terms, just remember they have been taught repeated by, re repeatedly by the ordinary magisterium of the church. Uh, back from, especially with things like you know, co-redemptrix and mediatrix and advocate, uh, officially from the middle of the 19th century uh, by our popes repeatedly, one after another, up to the present time. And so we know this is Catholic truth. So conform your heart to what your head knows is true. And that's what comes from the Vicar of Christ in his official capacity, what we call the Magisterium. She is the co-redemptrix. She is the mediatrix of all graces. She is advocate. And that's not just contained in side comments. That, that's contained, contained in consistent, repeated papal teachings. And it will never go away because the Holy Spirit makes no mistakes. And he, he, he cannot turn the development of doctrine backwards as if he says, oops, I shouldn't have had this pope officially say this as part of the magisterium. Again, I'm not talking about side comments. I'm talking about official doctrinal statements in official uh, doctrinal, uh, doc, uh, uh, documental levels, right? Encyclicals, apostolic letters, etc. The Spirit makes no mistakes. And that's why one day we will have a dogma. We will have a solemn proclamation that Our Lady is the spiritual mother of all peoples, co-redemptrix, mediatrix of all graces, and advocate. And then we will have the key to the triumph of the Immaculate Heart. Then we will have a historic release of grace. Then we will have a manifestation that what Jesus gave us on Calvary, the mother, is ultimately the means by which we will obtain an era of peace. And there will be no other way. The longer we delay in acknowledging Our Lady as the spiritual mother of all peoples, the longer we delay as a human family the era of peace. Let's respond to the graces, oh, such great graces, from oh, so great a God and oh, so great a mother. Thanks for being with us from Mary Live. God bless you all.